Hello, everybody. This is Robin Harford from eatweeds.co.uk and welcome to another episode of the Eat Weeds podcast. Show notes can be found on the webpage at eatweeds.co.uk. Today, I'm with an artist from South Devon called Flora. We met three years ago in Sussex and you're obviously really embedded with plants and plants are a big part of your life. And being an artist and someone who creates natural dyes, when I go through the ethnobotanical record, there's a lot of focus on craft materials from wild plants. I'm very curious about how you started walking what I refer to as the green path. Hello, my name is Flora Arbuthnot. Yeah, it's a great question. It's been a bit of a circuitous path, I guess it always tends to be, doesn't it? I grew up in the countryside in Gloucestershire, had a rural upbringing with a lot of freedom to be out in nature a lot of the time. But I wasn't really aware of that until I went to art school in Glasgow and living in the city and suddenly started to feel like something was amiss. I was feeling disconnected and all sorts of stuff was coming up for me and I couldn't put my finger on it and I needed to, to find meaning in life that life felt meaningless. And I realized that we had to choose what meaning was in life, that it didn't, wasn't just there, I had to create meaning. So I decided to choose, yeah, choose the green path to, to choose that. For me, the meaning of life is about being part of, of mother nature, of all natural systems, and to choose to live a life that was connected with that. I stumbled across this permaculture course in South Devon. I was in Scotland at the time, and it was in permaculture activism and spirituality. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. But I'm quite naively just sort of turned up into this very intense two-week experience with this woman called Stumble, who I'd never actually heard of before. She's this very powerful, worrying elder in earth spiritual practices. And we were doing a lot of singing and drumming and ceremony, and I sort of completely jumped, plopped into that from, with no experience, and that completely changed my life. But it took quite a few years to integrate that. And I was my life was very mainstream. I was studying product design. Then the innovation was human-centered design. And I was like, wow, we're doing human-centered design. Isn't this um, amazing and connected? And I was like feeling, no, there's something missing. There's something missing. It's not just about humans. Like what's going on? And not able to really engage in the industry because of that. And it was like all these materials, where are they coming from? They all just appear in packets. Like the wood is all perfectly cut into rectangles and the, all the materials, all this plastics, it was just felt disconnected. Yeah, I'd got into horticulture and growing and then learned about natural dyes and, and plant dyeing in my early 20s. And it just was like, oh, wow, it just brought everything together for me to be like, there's a process where I can work with the plants and also continue my creative practice in some way. So I was already doing a lot of printmaking. My mother is a printmaker, so I grew up doing printmaking. That's something I always came back to. And so I was like, wow, I, I can work with the, the plants and integrate that into my creative practice, which is, was how I, was how I, uh, how I expressed in the world. And yeah, and then it's been a circuitous journey from that because I've got into growing horticulture, but then actually aren't we, I want to connect with nature. I don't just want to be doing too and controlling and reading and controlling the environment. I want to just be with what's there. So then I, I was in Devon and I seemed to have been always drawn to Devon for this kind of learning and came across Fiona Campbell, who is a, a forager in South Devon and was very much drawn to her way because it was very much about, you know, we'd go out in silence with her. I mean, we'd take a vow of silence and we'd go out and she would show us the plants and we would just look at and connect with the plants with such detail. We would be like the, the texture, the color. Like we spend a lot of time just looking, just focusing on very few plants and really opening our senses and focusing deeply into observing and that maybe there's that and I think it's like a bosley thing like the way my body and my nervous system responds to that kind of focus and connection with what is and that level is like deeply calming and connecting and yeah and so much about going out to meet what is rather than going out to hunt for something although that can be exciting too so then got into foraging 
for food and medicine as well as dyeing. For me, it's a way of life that the dyes and paints and inks is my, my how I developed professionally. But for me, it's part of a wider approach to living, which is about being with the seasons and being in my local area, connecting. And, and then it's like a homecoming, like that feeling, like I, you must have this, Robin, like this thing of every time I encounter a particular mushroom in a place or a particular plant in a place near where I live, it's like a richness that builds up of this story, this patchwork, and it's with the seasons and it's then that place becomes so alive with those stories and memories and I whenever I go back there even if that mushroom isn't there it's oh this is where I found this and there's this kind of it's just this homecoming feeling which it yeah it creates that that wholeness that I was missing so much back when I was in the city and a bit lost that sounds really nourishing that sounds you know almost coming out of the the desert and starving and then just being filled with this grand swell of nature and that all your relationship with nature, which I find, I find happens so often when people start out on this kind of little green path, like, like you said, you just happened to see this thing in Glasgow and ended up in Devon with the crazy Starhawk. How odd, cause I've got a story about Starhawk years ago, back in the early nineties, I co-managed a bookshop on, oh dear, now I'm going to have to fess up. It was on new age kind of spirituality, personal development. And the, the bosses used to set up workshops and Star was one of the first people to come over. So I ended up being a gopher. Basically I drove her around and carried her luggage <laughs> for a free place on one of her gigs. Yeah. She's very cool. Very cool. But yeah, that kind of. Just by chance is how so many people seem to, to end up involved in this work in some form. So you, you landed, what was it about dyes? Is it because I assume it's because you did printmaking when you were younger and because it's part of your, your family, certainly your mother's work. So what was, what take us through, through the process. Do you just use the traditional plants that have historically been used for dyeing or are you trying to find new plants or are you an experimentalist in that sense or a traditionalist? I, I have a very broad approach, a bit, I'm a bit hyperactive and kind of uh, very expansive in the way I think, which means that I like to include a lot of different perspectives and approaches, but ultimately for me, it's about exploring and it's about process. I'm not particularly interested in just, you know, producing to sell, just replicating and producing to sell for me. It's about the, the, the process of connection and the inquiry and the, um, exploration and the mystery about of what might happen. So all the work I produce, every piece of work I produce is an exploration and it's different, but yeah. So when natural dyeing is a field, which is, there's a lot of records. There's a lot of information and there's a rich history. So I'm of the view that there's no point reinventing the wheel. Most dye plants that are effective have, have been used you know, a lot. So I like to look back and to use what is and to, to use those records and not just go in blind. It's a combination. So I work with traditional dye plants like madder, um, and let's say weld and woad plants that you can cultivate that have been bred like vegetables, but for dyes that they've been bred, they've been specifically bred for dyeing and they're particularly effective to getting more distinctive and vibrant colors. And those are great. Cause I like, I also, cause part of my work is about demonstrating and showing that you can create colors that can compete with synthetic dyes and really showing that so that dyeing doesn't just become pigeonholed as something which is just about fudgy beige beiges. I think that's really important. But at the same time, I also love going out and working with plants that are on the land and working with locally available plants and seasonal plants. And um, yes, yeah, so like you know, oak galls and brambles, nettles, St. John's wort, um, working with also with like invasive plants that are taking over like Bedlia and Staghorn sumac, 
finding those plants that are, it's like finding those, it's like finding the abundance that's current, that's tapped, or it's not, I love harvesting sumac because it's like, there's so much, it's so useful to me and no one's going to care how much I take because it's so annoying for gardeners. So sumac is, doesn't have much color at all. That's what's curious about it. It's very high in tannins. So by itself, it's a very pale and it's almost, but if you apply an iron oxide with the tannins, you get blacks and greys. And, and there's a lot of, because we live in a damp country, there are many plants that are very high in tannins. And those are very interesting to work with in relationship with the iron, because the, there's a relationship between tannins and iron, which creates blacks. And that can be interesting for printing. Because you can then dye your fabric with, let's say, sumac, and it's you can't see any colour. And it's like invisible ink. You print, you can print them with iron, and then the, you get these blacks. Where you can make inks with them. Yeah, so it's some kind of a commit, like the mystery as well. Like a lot of these plants, sumac, you dye with it, and you know it's not done anything. But if you, know, if you add this other extra secret ingredient, then something. That's alchemy, isn't it? That's alchemy. Yeah. 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 Well, what I mean, metals. That's pretty alchemical. <laughs> I do work with metals, which um, I was resistant to for years. So I thought I want to be one day purist and just work with the plants. Or actually, I've come to see that metals are a part of the land too. And it's but as Mike said, it's a patchwork, isn't it? So how many? Okay, so in my own work, when I look for the food plants, I'm not only staying with just Britain. I'm going transglobal. Mm -hmm. uh, or pan global, whatever the word is. So I might find a particular species in another country that's not necessarily recorded or has not necessarily been recorded over here. It doesn't grow here because obviously climate, but I might look at the genus and try and find plants over here of the same genus. And then we were talking earlier about Frank Cook and Frank Cook always had this thing of if he find so he would say travel to Africa to find a plant in Africa, edible or medicinal. He come back to, but he was American, but he hung out a lot down in where you are in Devon around Schumacher College, um, and he'd look at the genus and see if there was a, a local genus and or a variety in the genus here, and then he'd experiment and play to see whether or not it would have food uses or medicine uses do you stick just with traditional dye plants of this land i know you mentioned mm. invasive so obviously not but do you do you explore globally i know that you're yeah. like your japanese stuff so yeah i'm very influenced by a natural dyer called michelle garcia french natural dyer and his work has been traveling around the world with, uh, going to, to places where there has been a tradition of natural dyeing that's become lost because of colonization and in industrialization and then supporting those communities to regenerate, redevelop those traditions. And he's a chemist and his approach has been to understand the chemistry then, and the botany, as you say, of understanding plant families, then you can be like, we need to work with a plant that's high in tannin, let's say, or we need to work with a plant that's accumulating in aluminium. And then you can just look in the landscape and work with the plants that are locally available rather than shipping in exotics yeah and i love that idea yeah so like I, from him i learned from him about there are plants that are accumulating in aluminium like in indonesia there's a tree called the simplocus cochinchinensis tree which is um, the world's most powerful bioaccumulator in aluminium wow. the leaves contain three percent aluminium and they're used in southeast asia for thousands of years as a fixative for dyeing and i actually do use those leaves i buy bags of those leaves from Indonesia. That's a tradition that's specific to Southeast Asia. But we, what's curious, which I am curious about, and Michelle Garcia says that there are other plants that are accumulating, particularly camellia, rhododendron, and hydrangea, if they grow on acidic soil. So there's this mystery. I haven't gone into it so deeply, but there is this curiosity about um, if you could start working, they're not local. Well, they're not native plants, but they have been planted here. So that's, so you, there is that parallel. But then also you know, we have wild madder, we have ladies bed straw, which are relatives of Rubia tinctoria, which is the cultivated madder. And they can give, those plants will give from the roots a pale pink, which isn't as vibrant as the, as the dyer's madder. You, yeah, there is that as well. And the other thing which I find curious is that it's not always 
logical. So indigo is a pigment you can extract from various plants that grow around the world. But what's curious is that those plants, and many of those plants aren't related to each other. So we have woad in the UK, which is a cabbage family. But then we have Japanese indigo, which is polygonum tinctoria, which is actually a nut weed. It's completely unrelated. And then there's um, indigo ferro tinctoria, which is also completely unrelated. But they all contain the precursors for indigo, which is a very specific kind of pigment. So there's a mystery there as to what's going on. That's interesting. I was in, in Laos in 2013 and in the forest up there and in the north and I, I stayed with, well, she basically dragged me into her family and I, I stayed with the dyer and a weaver very much. She was trying to keep and, and keep alive the Laos weaving and dyeing practices. We forgot really with war and the communist kind of regime and stuff with hill tribes, not liking them. And yeah, I never. That's a good point. I need to find out what the plants were that she used because she just said, oh, indigo. And it was like, because I was under the assumption that indigo is a really hard color to create. Is that? It's, I guess it's, it's, there's a very specific processes. It's completely different to any other plant dye process. It's, you have to do a chemical reaction or a, bio, or a um, fermentation reaction to create indigo compared to other dyes where you just essentially make tea you just extract the plant into water so yeah it's very specific kind of process okay so with with your relationship with plants and your creative work i'm personally i don't actually talk about this normally but we're going to talk about it because it's appropriate i'm fascinated by when i'm out in landscape working with plants and I slip into that kind of flow state, that very present in the moment. And then things come to mind almost. If you're into shamanism, I suppose you'd say the plant spirits were talking to you. Well, I, I don't do shamanism, but I am interested in how the human animal gets inspired and creativity and, and where does inspiration arise from? And it seems to me that the more I engage with landscape, the more inspiration comes through. Call it insight, if you want to call it. Mm. I, I, I try and bring everything down to terra firma and not make it all go a bit spooky. Yeah. As an artist, when you're working with plants, do you get those kind of creative flashes going on? It's con connected, but it's different. I think for me, there's a reason why I work. I like to work with plant dyes and also inks and then paints and then also I make herbal medicines and I also eat plants and I find it's I get inspiration for the the interchange between those practices and start into the connections I love Herb Robert you know, I'm really drawn to Herb Robert such a joyful plant it's always around always there to, to um, bring joy and laughter it's high in tannins which means it's a fantastic plant to print with and I love that because I'm learning about the medicinal properties of the plants and I'm really into sensory herbalism and to taste a plant and to be able to taste how it might, how to taste certain flavors, which might imply certain properties that then mean I could work with it as a paint or an ink or a dye. Like Finding the connections between those practices and that, make, that makes me, so if I have an experience with, let's say, herbal medicine, or with printmaking that makes me then look at dying in a completely different way, change my perspective, then I get a lot of inspiration from that. Whereas if I just stay in one field, I get a bit stagnant and a bit limited somehow. And so how what do I have to offer that one field? There's people who would just spend their whole lives in one of those fields. So and I can't, that's not what, what, my, what I'm about. I'm about being a holistic hunter-gatherer we're more of a gatherer, really. And I believe that's how we were. Like, we were generalists. And, we were, and everything is connected. And that's the connections between things is very inspiring. And, yeah, as you know, mentioned about the being with the plants and those moments, which, um, yeah, to be honest, I feel a bit of grief around that, actually. Because I've been 
very connected. I've been very connected and I have a very strong practice. And to be honest, this year, I haven't gone so until maybe two weeks ago, I have really neglected that practice. I think because it's been, my system hasn't been able to drop down because of the general feeling of not feeling safe, which has meant I've been in a different mode, which has been very much like very busy and doing stuff, but not sinking into just being with the plants in that way. Yeah. So it feels quite distant to me a little bit. Like I have this longing of that to go back there and it will come, but it's not there at the moment. Yeah, the lockdown's been been an interesting one for me because normally I would be out teaching all the time. I'd be outside the whole time. And with the lockdown, certainly the first lockdown, it was, oh, okay, this is a bit, bit odd. And so I I forced myself to, which I don't normally do because I'm incredibly undisciplined, but I, I had to do it for my insanity was to actually get out every day and just go and find my place, find my spot that I, what I call a sanctuary spot, immersed as much in, <laughs> I'm by a river. So I just go down to the river edge and hide out in the reeds and the rushes and sit on a nest. I'm a robin after all. And I found that was really beneficial to keep me, keep me slow and steady and not allow the anxiety or the stress to take hold, which it, I think there's a, there's been a collective fear and anxiety, certainly when I look online and I've had to stay off, off the social media, a lot of it, because I just couldn't deal with the, the crazy, the craziness that was going on. So yeah, it, it, it is a strange year not having it there, but I suppose we just walk out the door, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. You can see that. I think seeing how a lot of people have had this year as an opportunity to connect more deeply in their local area. And it's almost like, like I've been doing that for a few years and then this year I've been like I'm just going to be in my studio and be teaching and working and doing a lot more outward 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 you know, I've been doing a lot of online teaching and connecting and sharing and hearing stories from other people but not been going so deeply in myself that's okay though isn't it I think life throws us these curveballs that we just have to work with and yeah. on one hand you may have lost that depth of connection that you would normally have but on the other hand you're reaching your work is sounds like it's reaching a far wider audience as a result of this this strange digital medium that we're all communicating through everyone's listening to this podcast it's a digital medium but i think for me we we had a discussion before for me the the agenda for doing any of of my work is is not for people to stay and become a passive consumer it's to actually get out the door and start engaging so how have the online courses worked for you in the way because obviously dying and and natural working with plants it's a very embodied engaged somatic kind of process so how have you found it being translated to the digital medium and does, do you instruct people to go out and get involved with the, their plants or is it more of a dissociated teaching schedule? I'm just curious how people are teaching nature through a digital medium. It's, it's an interesting question because yes, similar to you, my, I like, I love how, I love the potential for online teaching and online sharing can be a kind of way we can support each other to connect more deeply to our local environment. It's like the kind of support group for connecting deeper with our actual local place. The way I teach is that I teach generic recipes and then I invite people to think about, to ask questions to Michael to think about what is it? What is natural dyeing for you? What is ink making for you why are you drawn to it and people are drawn to it for different reasons i think there's generally there's like people who are drawn to it to connect with their local plants and then there's people who want to make a bright red and a bright yellow and they don't mind where they get that from and i work with both those groups integrated but it's about yeah these interchange these general generic recipes which then people can go off and go out into the landscape or all go and buy specific dye plants if they wish to see what plants they're drawn to 
and then work with those plants with these recipes. So the recipes are like, like just the framework through which people can then bring in whichever plants they're drawn to, to work with. And so I have that as a, um, as kind of recipes and videos, tutorials. And then what is really important to me is that it's, well, for me in my practice, that the process is as important as the finished result. And, the, and, um, from my experience of learning about nature connection, and I think what's really important is to have a process where you get an invitation to go out and maybe given some kind of process or framework, and then there's an invitation to go out, people can go out. And there's also a coming back in and then sharing that story and having that heard and being able to reflect on that experience and to inquire into what, why, how in a group. So I always have a follow-up session about a month up for the, at the end of the course where people can come back and bring their whatever drawings or paintings or fabrics to show those finished results. But I'm personally more interested in what plants do you work with? Why would you work with those plants? What was that experience to collect them and how that, what, yeah, just to, to share those experiences. Cause I think that's, I find that interesting to hear about and yeah. So it's both, there's that kind of edge between, yeah, there is a finished product, an object, a dyed thing. There's also a story and a process and it's an inquiry as well. And I like that word. You keep using this word inquiry. Mm. I think it's a really powerful, for me, it, I have a resonance with it, it was a bit <laughs> better at mm. but the, there's something, there's something about it. And I, and I, I love how you just express that it's the process. You're not actually talking about the end product. You're talking this process that goes on. And I got a real sense of when people come back and they're sharing those stories. I think it's such a powerful way to teach because it's not teaching really, is it? We teach a, you know, technique or something, but it's getting that feedback from the students and they're almost become the teacher as well through their process. Yeah. And that's what I love about online teaching is that because I'm able to pre-record the actual teaching bit, it frees me up to then be able to not just be doing that, which is quite actually quite intense. I can then have the space to be able to ask some more interesting, deeper questions. And I find that really fascinating. And I have such set up as groups. So I have an online course and then now I've just set up a group of kind of club of past students who want to continue that. And we have a get together on zoom every month for a little session inquire more deeply in that yeah that word inquiry for me which comes from the word inquiry comes from or doing having done more kind of inner work and the kind of inquiry the inner inquiry and then being interested in that there's an out there's always an inner inquiry and outer inquiry and they're both connected and did you do schumacher's horticultural i did yeah i did that schumacher horticulture apprenticeship in 2015 so does doesn't that touch on kind of Gertian science, that kind of process of inquiry? It does. Yeah. I don't, I didn't experience that so much there, but yeah, there was that aspect to it. Absolutely. I remember we used to go out and draw plants looking by observing them and in the Gertian, I'm not very good at talking about that kind of stuff. But yeah. It's quite complex. Like... How plants are expressing themselves. Absolutely. And yeah, I love that way of thinking in terms of working with plants through the year and the ways plants express themselves through the season. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do a, a, I kind of jump the tracks onto a new track here. Yeah. I just, I saw that you do Japanese shibori hmm. and for me, right from when I was a teenager, Japanese, um, woodblock cuts fascinated me and that whole natural aesthetic that Zen culture kind of embodies and expresses. So a bit of a self-indulgent question. What is Japanese shibori and what is it about it that you like? Cause you mention it quite a lot on your side. Japanese shibori, I mean, is a, a approach to creating pattern, repeat patterns on, not necessarily always repeat patterns, but pattern on fabric 
on paper by blocking off areas of the fabric through either using wood blocks or stitching. And generally the fabric is folded or bound and then the wood or the stitch you or a piece of wood with clamps or stitches are used in order to create pressure to stop the dye from being able to get to those areas of the fabric. And there are there are yeah there are many techniques you can use scratching techniques on on pieces of drain pipe to create ripple effects. I mostly do using wood do techniques using wood blocks and where you fold the fabric into a geometric pattern and then you add the block and then you get so, different effects and I love it because natural dyeing is a very can be a very labor intensive and multiple multi-stage processes it can get a bit out of hand sometimes the amount of preparation and stages and scouring and mordanting and second mordanting and then dyeing dunging and that's just it can get quite uh, elaborate and one of the things I like to do is to try and keep trying plan processes that have good effects but keep things simple so that doesn't become prohibitive and incredibly intensive and I love Shibori because it is very accessible and it's very quick and you don't need much to do it you just and it's you just need a piece of fabric and you can fold it and you can use you can use paper clips or clothes pegs or build it how, how do you get the dye into that yeah so you so you yes yeah, so you, you fold and bind the fabric and then you just put the fabric in the dye Okay. You can, sometimes you need to pre-wet the fabric first, depending on how you want the fabric to, the dye to absorb into the fabric. We just simply then just dye the fabric and then you take the fabric out of the dye and then you unfold it and then you have the pattern where the, where the dye hasn't reached, you have the white areas. And then you can do interesting things where you move the clamps and dye it again in different color and create different effects. And it's a kind of, it's a very new thing. So with, uh, okay, so when I was 19, I trained as a cabinet maker and my teacher was complete geeked out on Japanese tools. And then we would, and I think I mentioned this in the previous podcast or not, that we would make joints, Japanese joints, and they were very intricate. They were like magic boxes, puzzles, literally. But what I liked about it was that they're a joint, so they're hidden. All that work and the practice, no one's going to ever see. And I wondered with the Shibori, is there, is it part of that kind of Zen attentive working? What am I trying to say? Yeah, this, because it, it comes from Japan and Japan has this whole aesthetic and this practice that oftentimes it doesn't matter whether anyone actually sees it at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Generally, I'd say that there's a big culture of natural dyeing in Japan and that it does, you know, there is a particular indigo dyeing, the labor involved and the necessity for slowness and timing. You can't go fast. If you go fast, everything messes up and you have to go slow and be really gentle and you know, the way you add the fabric into the vat and you take the fabric out and the way it's hung and it's and the processes re require a certain level of slowness and attention, which I love in a large group. If you have sort of eight people and you usually got eight people, it's going to be really loud and rowdy. And then it's, we're going to bring in this intention for this slowness and, um, considered, a, considered approach, which is so necessary. And I, I see that as, and there's a lot of Japanese indigo dye. And then there's, yeah, with the shibori, particularly with stitching, there's a huge amount of labor, inte labor intensive processes with stitching and binding. And this kind of also what I love about it is this vision and you're binding and clamping and folding fabric with this vision of how a, this flat piece of fabric is going to look. And you're just stitching and binding and creating something which is actually a very small scrunched up object but there's this vision for how it's going to be which is going to be completely different and this small object which is taking going to take hours to bind and stitch and fold it's incredibly beautiful in itself it's a beautiful object but it's going to be dyed and then ripped apart <laughs> yeah. 
mystery of what is going to be revealed, which is completely different, looks completely different. And, um, yeah. That's great. I love all that kind of stuff. It, it's quite geeky, but it is really, I don't know what it is about it. I have a fascination with Japanese culture. And yeah. Would at some point in my life get on a boat and end up there just to explore their, 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 uh, craft and culture and their mm-hmm. plant culture. Actually, I have a friend who is a forager in France, Francois Coupla, and he has a, he's married to a Japanese woman and they have a center out in Japan. He says, once you get outside the cities, it's like it's, the plant knowledge is deep, very deep. They haven't lost it. Yeah. As we're just rediscovering it, aren't we? We're trying to recapture it. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, there's a Japanese paper, Indigo Paper Diary, who visited me last year. And what I was touched by was that's so niche. She was a Jack, she's an Indigo Paper Diary, and she was so dedicated to that. And there's something in Japanese culture where there is so much respect given to people who choose that path that m- must, that it just doesn't exist in our culture. It's you're going to go into industry, you're going to go into, and it's like, it's, it's something of the respect. And the way she was able to really, you know, commit to that in a way that, yeah, that I just found very inspiring. I respect the artist, don't they? Yeah. Whereas over here, it's kind of like, oh yeah, it's, it's different. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I'm curious about, I don't know, I don't know enough about Japanese culture to comment that about there, but here it's like. You, you get the respect once you've received a step, once you get to a certain status or success, but it's like the journey to get there, which isn't so supported. And it's kind of c- curious that. Writers, artists, craft people, always bottom of the rung, the starving artist. That's the classic kind of cliched statement, the starving artist. And so anyone who is listening to this show, firstly, thanks for getting this far. I hope it's been interesting. And Flora has a beautiful website. And as you can tell, he's obviously totally committed to her craft. And if you would like to do any of her workshops, whether they're in person, God willing, as the old saying says for next year, or one of her online ones, Flora, where do they need to go to check you out and find more out about you? I love your website, by the way. It's so clean and simple and minimal. It's yeah. And type, I'm a typography nerd as well. I'm a design nerd. I, so yeah, I love that weirdly I'm a sort of nature artist that loves computers. <laughs> sure. Paradox thing. So where do they go? What's yeah, so, the... um, yeah. So I have a website called plantsandcolor.co.uk. And that's C-O-L-O-U-R. Yes. UK spelling of color. That's it. And there I have listings for various work online courses at the moment. And I'm planning some workshops for next year, some events, which are going to be fantastic if that's possible. I'm also on Instagram, plants underscore and underscore color. Yeah. So get in touch if you're interested to get involved. Great. It's wonderful having you on. Like I said, I've been wanting to get you on for a good few years. So thanks for spending a bit of time. It's great to meet you again, Robin. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, pleasure.